Okay, welcome to this exciting uh, lecture. We're going to learn about uh, memory and learning uh, in this lecture. Okay, so these are our study aims from the block book. Um, I need to give you an idea of how learning occurs. Um, I'm going to focus especially on plasticity. And once you've learned something, you then make memory. So then we have to go through the different types of memory, such as reflexes and habits, um, and then working short-term and long-term memory. And then we're going to briefly touch on amnesia, amnesia and I'm going to mention all the different structures involved um, as well, and give you a brief sort of glimpse into how memory works. Okay, so I don't know how well you remember your neurophysiology um, of how the nerve works, and you need to remember how a uh, nerve works in order to understand the concept of plasticity. So let's quickly do a brief run through of how an action potential spreads from neuron to neuron. So basically we have um, in the neuron low levels inside the neuron of sodium and high levels outside uh, the neuron of the same sodium. And this um, difference in levels is maintained for sodium potassium pump. And thus you have an electrochemical gradient, and it's, there's a positive charge outside of the neuron. Now, if there's a neurotransmitter molecule that then binds to a receptor on the neurosoma of this neuron, which uh, is positively charged extracellularly, uh, proximal to that um, neurotransmitter receptor, there's some ion gates. These ion gates open and it allows that sodium that's lying outside of the cell at that point to flood in and then suddenly you have a change in electrochemical gradient in that one spot. Yeah, the charge becomes positive inside the cell at that ion gate. Now these sodium ions sort of rush in through the gate and uh, through the physical process of diffusion they decide okay let's rush down this axon because there's so few of us da further down this axon so let's all uh, run down the axon. But as the sodium ions are running down inside the cell, down the axon, um, they hit the next couple of gates. And as soon as they hit these ion gates, they open up and then even more sodium starts to flood in at every single gate that opens. And therefore there's this constant rush of sodium into the cell, constant rush of um, sodium going down the axon towards the terminal end of the neuron until eventually we reach the end of the neuron, we reach the, uh, the axonal uh, terminals. And so the sodium is rushing right uh, sort of to the finish line and it hits the finish line and then at that point it opens up another ion gate but this time it's a calcium ion gate, not a sodium ion gate. So right at the end of the neuron, instead of more sodium coming in, calcium instead comes in and calcium binds to vesicles that um, are present at the end of a neuron in the in the axonal terminal. These vesicles are full of neurotransmitters and when calcium binds to the vesicle it forces the neurotransmitters to be released into the synaptic cleft uh, or synaptic space um, at the end of the axonal terminal. And thereafter the neurotransmitter will then go to the next neuron or to a muscle fiber if it's an innervating a muscle fiber or whichever structure it's innervating. And then the end result is that you have a nerve that's full of sodium and full of calcium and has emptied itself of neurotransmitters. And then to reach back to the first state, we have sodium potassium um, channels, or sorry, potassium channels that open up, potassium leaves the neuron, and then sodium potassium pumps repump the sodium ions back into the extracellular space. There's also a pump to repump calcium back into the extracellular space and then the vesicles regenerate the neurotransmitter. So that's briefly how the action potential works. Alright, so now that you know how a synapse fires, what you need to know is that whenever a synapse fires, fires there's usually some sort of feedback mechanisms in place. I'm not going to go into detail into the exact sort of receptors and channels and gates and that sort of thing. Um, it's not that clinically useful to know. What you need to understand is that synaptic firing causes feedback changes which can either enforce or weaken that synaptic connection. So 
By enforcing a synaptic connection, what means is perhaps the axon terminals um, um, grows more closer towards the receptor or uh, more neurotransmitters are generated for the next impulse um, or reabsorption of neurotransmitters is increased um, various other mechanisms that can be used to uh, improve synaptic firing by weakening the opposite process perhaps um, the distance between the axon terminal and the um, next synaptic receptor increases or uh, there's less neurotransmitter available in that axon terminal. So learning occurs when pathways are reinforced between neurons. In other words, multiple synaptic connections uh, through a whole group of neurons are reinforced. And um, what's important to understand is that memory is stored by pathways not by the neurons themselves. So no information is actually stored in the neuron. But the the way that the neurons are arranged, uh, the way that elect, uh, electrical signal is sent um, through different neurons, that is the actual memory. So it's the sort of it's almost like it's the journey, not the destination, that is the actual memory. And we refer to these pathways as memory traces or engrams. Now when we have multiple neurons that have this um, enforcement of the synaptic connections to make a memory trace, we call that uh, synaptic potentiation. And usually there has to be a stimulation in order to enforce the synaptic potentiation. Either you have to um, repeat something over and over, or you have to be really interested in the work. Um, but um, uh, as long as you're stimulating a memory um, for example of this lecture by listening to this awesome audio commentary while reading the slide because you're um, stimulating those neurons that are absorbing um, this amazing information you're now potentiating the synapses in your brain and hopefully you'll remember this uh, should I ask it in the block test. So how does the potentiation occur? Um, Basically, we have alteration. There's multiple ways, but um, part of it's alteration cellular membrane channels. Um, in other words, it's um, easier for calcium to enter the neuron to release those vesicles. Um, it's easier for neurotransmitters to return into the neuron. Um, they fire off at a um, lower sort of threshold. You don't need as much AT, um, as um, much stimulus to cause those gates to open. Um, there's increase in cyclic AMP, so vesicles are formed faster, neurotransmitters are formed faster, um, calcium is pumped out back into the extracellular space faster, the sodium-potassium pump works faster, etc., etc. Then uh, um, at the end of a neuron we have all those um, dendrites um, that, that form the axonal terminals, and these dendrites in and of themselves can grow little spines. and um, through the growth of these little spines, um, the space between a neuron and the next sort of neuron uh, can dramatically uh, shorten. Um, and on the, on the other hand, if there's atrophy of these dendritic spines, you can have memory loss due to the um, neurons literally growing apart from each other. The postsynaptic neurons also have changes, so um, they, for example, will upregulate the amount of neurotransmitter receptors they have, so they're more, it's more easy to stimulate them. Um, their increase in cyclic AMP means that um, a stimulus is going to cause a stronger response. Um, uh, also, the, uh, they might grow bigger. Um, um, uh, so that they can send off a more powerful action potential. And some parts of the brain have uh, stem cells and can actually generate uh, new neurons through the power of these stem cells uh, and create new neurons and that process is referred to neurogenesis. Uh, for a long time it was thought that the brain has absolutely no ability to make new neurons uh, well, once you are born, but turns out there are some stem cells in certain memory critical areas of the brain and you can actually generate new neurons uh, to make new memories. Okay, so in order to cause all these changes, we need to uh, upregulate certain uh, the expression of certain DNA strands, and that, and that means basically, in practice, upregulation of 
protein synthesis because all these membrane channels and spines and the growth of the neurons and neurogenesis all this requires proteins to be synthesized and built uh, up into uh, channels or new neurons etc etc so obviously and conversely anything that can block that protein synthesis uh, will cause problems uh, with potentiation and will cause problems either with learning uh, or memory so for example uh, a bad concussion um, often causes amnesia to the events just before the person uh, received that bad knock uh, to their head and the reason for that is that um, the concussion can tear up uh, dendritic spines and um, can uh, sort of disturb the production of the proteins required to uh, actually remember the events that happened up to the concussion an electroshock um, can um, disrupt the synthesis of proteins and your protein generating mechanisms uh, and also is associated uh, with amnesia to for the sort of couple of minutes before um, the electroshock so this ability of neurons to change in response to a stimulus in order to potentiate is referred to as plasticity in other words the neurons can change their shape for a growing um, dendritic spines or growing in size and can change the structure of the cellular membrane and the long-term result is uh, what we call long-term potentiation so um, if you enforce a memory long enough or if there's a strong enough stimulus um, these changes will become all these changes will become semi-permanent meaning that it's going to be quite difficult to forget this information you're going to have long-term potentiation whereas if you have a bad knock to the head during a rugby game and you develop a concussion um, you actually because by disrupting protein synthesis you lose the ability to have long-term potentiation and therefore uh, you might completely lose the ability to remember events for about say five minutes before you received your concussion injury Okay, there's other ways that the pathways interact with learning and memory and in that sense um, forgetting can actually be thought of as a, as a way of learning um, on a neuronal level um, basically um, it's the opposite process that's been described in the previous slide uh, forgetting occurs when pathways between neurons decay uh, there's loss of the solid membrane channels there's uh, atrophy of the dendritic spines uh, down regulation of neurotransmitters as is usually due to an absence uh, of stimulation although it can also be caused by trauma and uh, degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and it's useful because this allows the brain to not waste energy on facts and figures and information that is not necessary um, to um, immediate sort of survival it's not useful um, basically if you're not bothering to try and remember something the brain interprets it that uh, that that thing is not worth remembering and it shifts energy resources rather to things that are worth remembering and stuff that um, you're constantly stimulating yourself every day such as um, articles from Cosmopolitan or uh, GQ magazine uh, whereas the useless stuff that you only read from time to time that's in your medical textbooks your brain interprets that as useless because you're not reading it often enough and then it forgets it habituation uh, is another type of learning and what this what happens is that um, instead of upregulating synaptic uh, connections with through constant stimulation this is a situation when neurons actually lower um, their activity um, basically um, ignoring uh, a stimulus rather than being uh, potentiated by it and through this process of habituation we learn to ignore non-relevant stimuli so hopefully um, if you ever for example like myself I once got uh, I once had to live in a flat that was by a railroad track and uh, for about a month or so I found the trains riding parts to be quite disturbing uh, but eventually I got so used to it that um, I didn't even notice the trains riding past uh, anymore someone actually had to say oh there's a train riding by it's like oh yeah you're right um, I've become so habituated to the trains that I um, 
that they weren't even entering my conscious. So what happened was my brain had actually learned to ignore um, the train uh, trains riding past by deliberately lowering neuronal activity that was there that uh, would become aware of those trains. Sensitization, uh, on the other hand, is when you have heightened neuron activity even though you have a small stimulus, and it's usually due to a nauseous stimulus. Um, so, for example, if uh, once upon a time you went to McDonald's and you ate a Big Mac and you developed severe food poisoning right afterwards, um, for the rest of your life, every time you walk past a Big Mac, uh, a McDonald's, even though you're not ordering anything in a McDonald's, you might remember that horrible case of food poisoning you had, and you might feel nauseous just by walking past uh, a McDonald's. So it's a sort of disproportionate response. Um, um, you, you basically learn to be disgusted by something before it's even come close to you, and uh, we refer to that process sensitization, and as I said, it's usually in response to a nauseous stimulus, something that disgusts you or makes you sick, um, so that even the smell of it or even thinking about it makes you feel ill. And uh, these two processes are referred to as non-associative learning, um, basically non conscious learning. Um, you don't have to sit and study uh, a textbook in order to learn how to ignore trains or learn how to be disgusted. It's something that happens automatically. Um, it's a learned response to, and it's usually to a single uh, stimulus um, rather than a complex stimulus. So trying to learn um, the differential diagnosis of um, left-sided paralysis uh, requires you to have lo uh, be able to um, memorize lots of different ideas, lots of different sort of concepts. Um, but once we narrow it down to a single little stimulus, um, rather than having a complicated picture of, of things that you have to learn, then we actually kick in with our non-associative learning. I'm going to focus a bit on this concept of a long-term potentiation that was mentioned uh, a few slides back. So the definition of it is a um, development of a persistently enhanced presynaptic stimulation and postsynaptic response uh, between two neurons. So it's persistently enhanced, it lasts for uh, a reasonable amount of time. It's not just uh, a couple of seconds, it's at least a few hours, if not days, if not months, if not years. And uh, the trigger for this, um, for generating this persistently enhanced connection is that increase in intracellular calcium ions that happens at the end of, um, of, the, uh, of the axon. So if you're trying to memorize something that neurons constantly stimulating um, a pathway for that memory. Those neurons involved are constantly trying to suck in intracellular calcium in order to release vesicles, and the neuro the body detects this um, this unusually high level of calcium within the neurons um, in a certain part of the brain, and will then trigger uh, start off sort of cascade of changes that will. Um, uh, enhance that uh, those connections uh, over the long term. On the other hand, we also have a concept called long-term depression, um, where um, it's somewhat like the opposite process, where you have persistently decreased synaptic strength, and um, it's uh, it's a bit more mysterious and less well described. But it appears to be the main way that the cerebellum learns. The cerebellum is involved in learning uh, different movements. So if you're going to a martial arts school, or if you're learning to drive, certain movements will be memorized by the cerebellum. And the way the cerebellum works is more at, um, more by cancellation of useless pathways uh, uh, as opposed to enforcement of useful pathway. So that, that cancellation of the less useful pathways is long-term depression. Right, so we've discussed how um, the neuronal pathways can form as a process of learning, and once you have those pathways formed and there's long-term potentiation of the pathways, you then have a memory. Now, there are two types of memory. 
um, one which requires awareness um, and uh, requires also awareness for recall and uh, a type of memory that is not as dependent on the process of awareness. So the uh, process that requires awareness and consciousness is called explicit memory. That is, for example, uh, when you're studying the slide and hearing my soothing voice, um, you are aware of my voice, aware of the slide, using your consciousness, your awareness to learn about the two types of memory, uh, namely explicit and implicit memory. And then when you're writing the um, in the test, um, if I ask you a question on what are the two types of memory, you didn't have to consciously remember uh, the slide and the sound of my soothing voice, and you have to consciously write down that there's explicit and implicit memory uh, in the test. So um, on both sort of ends, uh, it requires consciousness and um, as part of this necessity for awareness you have to have a working hippocampus um, as well as the parts around the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe which we refer to as the parahippocampal areas those are also uh, required in order to form these kinds of memories implicit memory on the other hand is not as dependent on awareness uh, and as such does not require the hippocampus and does not require conscious thought in order to um, bring bring it back uh, implicit memory is more sort of habits and conditionings so for example when you're learning to play a piano um, you might need a bit of consciousness and awareness at first learning to play the piano um, but eventually um, it becomes automatic so you just read the notes off the sheet music or if you remember the notes by memory you just remember it but then your the way your hands move across the keys is automatic think also um, learning to ride a bicycle <coughs> does require a bit of awareness at first otherwise um, you'll fall off even more than you would or, or usually but um, once you've learned to ride a bicycle chances are you'll have that lifelong implicit memory of how to ride a bicycle and you don't ever actually don't even have to actually remind yourself how does one ride a bicycle you just hop on and ride um, swinging a bat to hit a ball for example uh, might take you a few uh, turns to um, sort of get the, the motion sort of down um, but it's not that you need a lot of consciousness and you need to really think about how to swing a bat the next time you swing a bat. Um, chances are you more or less remember how it's done. <coughs> so that, that sort of memory process does not, uh, is not as dependent on the hippocampus. <coughs> so people who have damage to the hippocampus will often struggle to form explicit memories and the struggle to learn new information they'll struggle to remember street addresses and names and uh, they'll struggle to learn new things and write exams um, but they might not struggle so much with uh, playing with learning how to play a piano or learning how to ride a bicycle they might not remember um, when they were learning to play the piano but the, um, so for them it will be quite mysterious the one moment they can't play the piano and the next moment they can because they can't remember uh, when they were learning to play the piano because that requires explicit memory but that implicit sort of um, uh, motion memory or habitual memory um, condition memory that forms the implicit memory uh, family those can still form uh, even in a person that has that damage to their hippocampus so a person of hippocampal damage can still learn to ride a bicycle even though he'll never learn um, he'll never be able to learn your name <coughs> and uh, I think I have mentioned this in a previous slide uh, that pathway that forms and uh, that contains that uh, is the actual uh, memory itself um, is referred to as, mem as a memory trace or an engram so discussing explicit memory in more detail so the expi explicit memory requires a functioning hippocampus and also requires parahippocampal regions um, which practically uh, translates into um, basically the medial part of temporal lobes that sit right next to the hippocampus. Uh, relevant regions of the neocortex, because memory storage occurs in the neocortex. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, where working memory is involved, and the thalamus, uh, 
uh, on both sides of the brain because it's required for uh, allowing the different parts of the brain to communicate with one another to coordinate memory formation and responses to memory. Okay, so the hippocampus has stem cells and is constantly able to generate new neurons and presumably um, it has all these new neurons in order to, uh, to go through the process of making new memories. Um, and there are several different types of memories. Uh, the prefrontal cortex especially is involved with working memory, which is a very brief memory that lasts just as long as you need uh, to do something. For example, if someone's telling you a phone number, um, uh, the person tells you the number and then that number is stored in your working memory and you're able to write it down. Um, whereas if after writing the phone number down about 10 minutes later if I try if I ask you to write the memory the phone number out of your memory uh, you probably won't even remember it because it was only in your working memory to begin with and the prefrontal cortex appears to be heavily involved with the storage of working memory and lesions to prefrontal cortex uh, give you uh, problems with working memory short-term memory um, is more involved with the hippocampus uh, and also involves the mammillary bodies of the hypothalamus. Uh, the short-term memory can hold about 7 to 12 pieces of information um, and this memory can last for seconds or even up to hours and through reinforcement of the short-term memory, whether it's by repetition or uh, whether it's by trying hard to remember it as you're reading it or uh, learning it, um, this short-term memory can become long-term memory and this um, this process basically involves um, reinforcement of synaptic pathways uh, within the hippocampus and more especially in various neocortical regions which will be responsible for long-term storage. And this process uh, can be disrupted by trauma and drugs. Um, so whereas new memory patterns form through the um, hippocampus, if there's trauma that disrupts the flow of that signal, or there's drugs that inflow that prevent the flow of that signal um, and prevent uh, signals going through output fibers, you can pre actually prevent memories being formed, which is why with concussion and with some drugs such as midazolam, you get anterograde amnesia, which is the inability to remember things that happened just before the event. If you have permanent damage to the hippocampus or permanent um, or stroke that damages the hippocampus permanently, you can even completely lose the ability to form uh, new memories. Okay, so in long-term uh, memory, uh, it can last for years or up to a lifetime. What happens is that the, para, uh, the hippocampus um, sends signals to the neocortex um, and various um, uh, parahippocampal regions in the medial frontal lobe. And uh, by constantly stimulating different patterns uh, in the neocortex, it can force uh, a pattern to uh, uh, b develop long-term potentiation and that basically uh, creates a memory. A nice thing about this is that it's fairly resilient to disruption. Um, even if you supposedly forget that memory, uh, you f for example, let's say you're learning a, uh, a new language, um, even though you might even though you might forget certain words or certain grammar rules after some time, when you refresh your memory, as it were, or try and say language again, you'll find it much easier the second time around because those memory patterns never completely went, uh, went away. And as I said, the hippocampus needs to kind of repeatedly stimulate various areas in the cortex and these memory storage areas are scattered throughout the um, cerebral cortex. Uh, Things related, for example, remembering a picture might be closer to the occipital lobe. Remembering um, a thought or an idea will be stored more in the frontal lobe. Remembering a sensation might be stored more in the parietal lobe, etc., etc. And then um, any memory of a strong emotional component is going to involve the amygdala. Um, and so emotions regarding memories uh, can also be stored in amygdala and uh, because emotion is involved um, these memories tend to be easier to remember because the amygdala is able to fire off si emotional signals into the hippocampus stimulating the hippocampus to uh, be more effective at memory formation.
Moving on to implicit memory. With implicit memory, um, the role of the hippocampus is not as um, important, um, and it's what the implicit memories might even be able to form independently of the hippocampus. And uh, there's various parts of the brain that deal with sort of different types of implicit memory. If you look at associative learning or so-called classical conditioning, um, if you develop a reflex emotional response, that's usually uh, something that's stored in the amygdala. So if seeing a per certain person makes you feel happy or excited, um, and every time you see that person you feel happy and excited, you can blame your amygdala for having learned that uh, this person is happy and exciting and um, excitement inducing and therefore it gives you that reflex emotional response. If you're a martial artist and you're or you're learning some other sort of skill that requires uh, learning movements of the body um, and you develop certain reflexes, um, then that's because your cerebellum has developed um, that reflex and remembers that reflex. So if you're in a street fight and you re reflexively raise your hands into a fighting stance, um, that's because all that martial arts training has been stored in your cerebellum, um, giving you that implicit memory and it uh, is able to pick it, uh, pull it very quickly out for you. Um, then various sort of um, procedures and skills and habits are stored in the corpus striatum, um, which is a part of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are responsible for storing especially um, stereotypical movements, and it's movements that you happen to do every day or regularly. Um, for example, driving a car. Um, when you first learn to, tr to drive a car, you're very clumsy and awkward and you struggle to push in the clutch and get the gear right, that sort of thing. Then after a while it becomes automatic um, and you even forget that you're driving a car because your basal ganglia is doing all the driving for you because the basal ganglia has learned how to um, do all the various skills and procedures required in driving a car. And same as, for example, putting up drips. Um, when you first uh, try and put up a drip on a patient, it's uh, really awkward and chances are you end up poking the patient ten times trying to get a drip up. And after a couple of uh, years of experience, you end up being pretty good and you can put up grey gel coats and really tiny veins uh, without too much um, of a hassle. Uh, it's also because certain um, nuances of the movement and skill of putting in up a drip have been learned uh, by your brain, probably in the basal ganglia. Right, so in this last slide, slide we're going to talk about failure of making memory or failure of recalling memory, in other words, amnesia. There are two types, anterograde amnesia and retrograde. Anterograde being the inability to make new memories, and these are usually due to lesions of the hippocampus, especially the hippocampus um, on the left side of the brain uh, is usually the dominant hippocampus with memory um, creation and memory storage. Um, so if this hippocampus is damaged, was the inability of this hippocampus to communicate for its outflow tracks to the relevant areas of the cerebral cortex uh, where memories are stored, um, you can lose the ability to form new memories. Retrograde amnesia is the loss of memories that are already formed, and that, can, that is due to lesions of the cortical areas where the memories are stored, so either stroke or tumor or trauma damaging specific cortical areas where memories are stored will cause loss of those memories. Also, degenerative disorders of the cortex, such as Alzheimer's, can also cause loss of stored memories.